I want to thank everyone for being here. I think I know most people here are Laura Thompson Barnes. And I just want to thank you for being here for the celebration of my father, Jack Thompson. If it weren't in COVID times, there would probably be hundreds of you here. And we had to say, how about just the folks that really knew Dad and really cared about him? So the folks that are here tonight, we really, really uh, appreciate you being here. Alicia Hughes said to me, she's our marketing manager, when Dad passed, how can that happen? He's invincible. And I think we all felt that way. He was uh, one of a kind. And it just seemed like nothing could touch him, and he kept on going no matter what. We always call him the Energizer Bunny because he just kept going and going and going and going. On behalf of my family, my mother, my sister Mindy, my brother John, John's wife Rochelle, my husband Jeff, my nieces and nephews, Jack, Chris, and Jillian Del Duca, and Colin and Taylor Thompson. I also want to welcome all of our employees. I think everyone knows that employees are the most important thing to our family. They always were to my dad. He put employees ahead of everything else. He wanted to make sure that our employees were happy and that they enjoyed their job and that they felt fulfilled. Uh, he knew that if people enjoyed what they did every day, that, that they would take care of our customers and he wouldn't have to worry about anything. So I just really, really want to welcome all of our employees. Um, so many of you have asked us this past year when we were going to do something for Dad because everyone just wanted to pay their respects. And I hope that he is shining down and looking at all of you here because he would be very happy, number one, to have his employees here. Um, and our employees represent Toyota, two of our Lexus stores, BMW, our Collision Center, our Detail Center, and our Black Bass Hotel. It's an amazing group of people doing an amazing array of different things, and you all make everything work together, and we're just so appreciative of that. For those that know Dad, Toyota is his absolute baby. He wouldn't be who he was without Toyota. Um, Toyota gave him his start. And no matter what he does, it's Toyota, 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 Toyota. So we thought it was only appropriate to have his celebration at the Toyota store. And then the other thing that we wanted to incorporate that's very meaningful to him is uh, just a sampling of his vintage car collection. And if you haven't gotten to go outside and see the cars, they're really quite special. We had a hard time figuring out what cars to bring down here. And the cars that we brought are all very meaningful and had a special story behind them. He was my dad, he was a father, he was a husband, he was a dealer, he was a restaurateur, he preserved land, and he was a pillar of our community. Everyone knows that new dad well, that he always says he's not in the car business, he's not in the restaurant business, he is in the people business, and I think he tries to convey that every day. John and I try to carry that forward. We have no choice. It was sort of ingrained in us since we were little. <clears throat> but there's a lot of things you don't know about my dad. And I thought that I would take a, a few minutes to explain a couple things, a couple stories that you might not have ever known. You might have seen the slideshow. <clears throat> there's some slides of dad when he was in the army and he was stationed in Panama. What you might not know is when he was in Panama, he adopted a pet monkey named Lucy that we always heard about our entire childhood. And it wasn't until after he died that I learned more and more about what he did in Panama because I was going through some of his things looking for pictures. And it really, it's amazing. I just want to say to anyone, if you have your parents, you need to learn about them why they're alive because I'm looking at this thing. How did you not know this? Why did you never talk about it? But I also found a pile of letters and I discovered that my grandparents called, and his sister, called him Jackie. How can I not know that? And I asked mom, she's like, oh yeah, did. They did call him Jackie. So I got to take out of that. I also, you know, you can't go anywhere with my dad. My dad loved to drive. No matter what you were doing, you would always know the right way to go. You never knew, how to, you, you never trusted what, your directions. No, 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 we're gonna go down here. And he always took the most circuitous route and we really do wonder if you really did know the best group because it always seemed to take longer than whatever. But like we'd be going down Kelly Drive in Philadelphia and he'd be saying things like, oh yeah, that, that was my mail route. I delivered mail there. I was like, you delivered mail? When did you deliver mail? 
And then he talks about, and Dave, you'll appreciate this, he put on roofs in Levittown. Now, Levittown, for those of you that are not around here, is Lower Bucks County, and it was where they were sort of building this huge complex out in the suburbs uh, for people to move out of the city. So dad was a roofer down in Levittown. And Mario, you'll appreciate this. You know who he met there doing the plumbing? It was Wally Dallenbach. <laughs> Wally Dallenbach was uh, an IndyCar driver, and he also became chief executive steward of championship auto racing teams, which is IndyCar. So it's funny, you never know where you're gonna develop a friendship that stays with you for life. But a lot of you do know the fact that before my dad got in the car business, he followed his dad into his own business, which was the cold meat delivery business. And they had a cold truck. And what that meant is they delivered cold meats and cold cuts and dried beef to delicatessens and grocery stores. Well, one of my favorite memories, believe it or not, was him getting me up at three o'clock on a Saturday morning and us driving down in his meat truck, which I thought was a pretty cool thing. I mean, what other kid, his dad, has a truck that you just open the back door and get like bologna and cheese whenever you wanted it. <laughs> Truly, it was a very cool thing. But we would go down to Philadelphia and we'd go down to Casper Avenue and Delaware Avenue and we'd go to the butcher shops and he'd load up his truck and then we'd go around to the delicatessens and the small grocery stores. For some of you that are in the, <clears throat> from the area, we would go to this little mom and pop store called, uh, it, which was owned by Mr. and Mrs. Gennardi's. Well, if you remember, Gennardi's supermarket became this big thing. All I remember is Mrs. Gennardi would always give me butterscotch crumpets. It was like worth it for Saturday. When he was driving me down there, he also had a hobby that not many people knew, and he played the harmonica. And we would travel the whole way, because it didn't have a radio, and he would play the harmonica as we were driving down. So I always have those cherished memories in my mind. A cherished memory that, well, might not be a happy memory, but it turned out to be one, was Dad sort of, when he got his mind to do something, he just did it. So I was six or seven, you were seven or eight. He came home to our house on Cedar Lane in North Hills and said, yeah, Lorraine, I went to an auction and I bought a farm in Bedminster, Bucks County. <laughs> Never told her. <laughs> As a child, I just remember that fight very clearly. <laughs> yeah, he bought it for $25,000, which we didn't have, is what mom said. So I don't know what she was more mad about, he moved out of the city against her will, or the fact that he spent $25,000 that we didn't have. But we all ended up loving the farm, and we still have the farm, and it's 60 years later, and we just had all these very, very happy memories there, and we have a love of animals, and it just became the core of our family. He also had this hobby, and um, there are Old New York Road Sports Car Club. That was one of his pride and joys. It was this group of men in Philadelphia, and it was um, the Holberts, the Pick Karens, and these other families, and as a little kid, I remember us going to rallies and picnics with Old New York Road Sports Car Club crew, and there were such fond memories. And these men, I didn't know it then, but they had money. We didn't have any money. So they'd go to these events in their sports cars. We'd go in our Morris Minor station wagon. And then they'd go out, we'd be at the Pitt Karen Estate, and they'd be taking their cars out in the fields and running them around in circles. And I just know we were always holding our breath because it was the car that we needed to go home in, and it's the only car we had. But it was good memories, it was really fun, but mom was always stressed. <laughs> but that led to something very interesting. Dad loved cars, he had no money to do anything. He wanted to be a car dealer in the worst way, but people from Ford, from Chevy, from Chrysler, from whatever, just sort of stopped him off. They wouldn't listen to him, and they wouldn't give him the time of day. And then he heard of this thing called a Toyota. No one had ever heard of a Toyota. And this one friend from Old Rivers Sports Car Club lent my dad $10,000 to open a Toyota dealership. Years later, when he was very successful, and trust me, it wasn't that much fun initially because nobody really liked to hear of these Japanese cars. Um, and it was, really, it was really tough for the first couple of years. But he, when he finally made it, he went to give this gentleman the $10,000 back. And the, 
gentleman said, no, just pay it forward. And I think that says a lot to my, about my dad and why he has done all the things that he did. But I'll never forget when he dad told us, mom and dad sat us down at the kitchen table. I was seven, you were eight. John was one. <laughs> and he said, uh, I'm, I'm not going to deliver meat anymore. I'm going to sell these things called a Toyota. And we're like, well, what is a Toyota? And you're not going to get rid of the meat truck, are you? We love the meat truck. <laughs> he did okay. But if you think about it, he did this when he was 36 years old. I mean, that takes a lot of bravery to do something unknown and to go into a business that he didn't know and to create what he has now just says a lot about the man and what he did. I remember in the early days, washing cars, working in the parts department, writing parts ROs by hand. You know, now everybody does parts inventory, computerized, imagine doing it by hand. Every little nut and bolt, I'll never forget it, it was horrible. <laughs> but then Toyota became successful and he needed a bigger place. And he was right on Main Street in Doylestown and he just said, I have to buy more land. So believe it or not, this was a chicken farm that we are on right now. And John and I were talking about it when we were putting our thoughts together on what to talk about. And this was so far out of town. It just seemed like it was too scary. Well, Doylestown is like this tiny little town. But that was a fear back then. But it, and that worked out OK, too. And then he, um, he wanted to, you know, he saw this BMW dealership way up 611 in this little town called Oddsville. And this was back in the early 80s. Nobody was buying BMWs unless you were a man and you were a racing car enthusiast. I remember year after year after year, we'd sell five BMWs. And, or not month after month, we'd sell five BMWs. And it just never made any money. We always thought we probably should let this thing go. It's just not going to make it. And, but we hung in there, and now we have BMW. And of course, the Lexus story, a lot of you people know the Lexus story. And I don't know where Julius is, but he tells the story far better than I am. And Dave Christ, I'm sure you know the story. But there was this gentleman from Toyota named Bob McCurry. And he sat down with my dad at a meeting or whatever, and they had a great friendship. And he was like a head guy at, at uh, Toyota. I think he sat down with my dad and Jack Taylor. You were there also. And they sat down, and he's like, uh, we've got this new thing. Jack, do you want Lexus? And dad, anything the Toyota did was perfectly fine. He goes, sure, what's Lexus? <laughs> You know, he didn't know if it was a book. He didn't know if it was, you know, a video. Sure, Toyota says, you want it. And so he says, well, we're going to make this luxury car. And I believe he said, Jack, you've got a dealership. And then I think he said, Jack Taylor, you also can have a dealership. Because I think, Jack, you were whining because they didn't offer you one right away. So you got the second one. <laughs> but anyway, so I just remember everyone saying, Lexus, Toyota's going to create a luxury car? Are you kidding me? You know, these other... These other manufacturers have been around for a century making their luxury cars, Cadillac, Lincoln. There's no way Toyota can make a luxury car. And I think, what, five to ten years later, we were like the number one luxury car there was. So he just had this vision to just grab, grab onto things and to make it work. And then Dad also was very big on preserving land and historic structures in the area. And he probably acquired over a, almost a thousand acres to preserve the land or historic structures. And then he started to look at restaurants and it's like, oh, dad, really? Do we really want to go there? But it became a huge project. And, uh, but we did, uh, he did buy one of the oldest inns in the country, the Black Bass Hotel. It's over 275 years old, and it's become quite successful. Then he got the Lumberville General Store across the street, and then recently took on the Golden Vezin Inn. So it became a restaurateur on top of everything else. But there's many, many stories we could tell. But that sort of gives you an idea of the man that he was if you didn't already know some of those things. And he also had another side of his life that was really, really important to him. And it had a lot to do with racing. And I will turn that over to my brother, John. What a great turnout. It really shows what an impact dad had made on this community. A lot of memories, a lot of thoughts. Laurie touched on 
Well, it seems like a lot, but there's so much more, and I'm not going to talk extensively if I did. She likes talking more than I do. But I did write some notes down, and I'm going to read it, excuse me, because I was originally reading notes, but I'm going to be a little more uh, rigid than Laurie was. So behind me is our first Toyota store, which I remember when he bought it in 1969. And since he was always a hands-on guy, he didn't have the budget to hire people. He did a lot of the work himself to get the store ready to uh, be open for business. Um, and that's the type of thing he always does. I think anybody who works here knows that my dad was a hands-on guy. He'd be washing his own car. He'd be out there pulling weeds. He'd be doing whatever it took to make the place look right. He'd get the right people here to make it run right, but he was always a hands-on guy. And that's always something that Laurie and I try to emulate. Um, I remember helping him. I think I was a big help. I was five years old. But I would do anything I could to help him get ready to go. I really believed I was a big help, even at five. I remember vividly working on specific jobs that he gave me. And really, I can remember like these woodworking jobs he gave me. Um, from there, I went on sweeping the old wooden floors in the shop. The shop was on the second floor here, and it was above the showroom. So when the techs would bring in, especially in the wintertime, would bring in cars and it'd be covered with snow, and that would be dripped down into the showroom. And so that was always a uh, fun. So we, but wooden floors in the shop, that's something you really don't see anymore. I went on to Washington Cars with my dad. Our love was always in the service farm. That's where we got to know people. That's where we got to know our customers. Um, he never sold cars, but he knew that the service customer was where it was key and where, and where we would keep the customer. His motto was always said, we're not in the car business, we're in the people business. And that continues to this day. It's something that will always never change. This, this business, this is his world. And mom knows this is where he spent Every, you know, his time, his office, when we remodeled here, we kept his office there because we, we had to basically redesign the whole building around his office. So, because he wanted to keep a look over everything. Um, but this is, this, the, the employees, his customers, that's what was important to him, and that's what Mel meant so much. Then you know, his other passions were racing. He loved doing car rallies, really anything car related. His racing ended by the time I was born. He continued in sports as an official with SECA for many years. And it was always, I was always there with him, watching and learning about the sport. Some of my fond memories were running race results at Pocono Raceway, down the bleachers of the tower, under the tunnel of the track, and back up to the start finish line so the, the stewards would have them. And that would be back and forth all day long. Um, also, um, the other fond memories are when he got to be a, a chief official of the Watkins Glen for Formula One races. Those races were epic, and to see the great racing drivers of that incredible era compete, he was always a well-respected official, and I was so proud of him and treasure those memories. We share a true bond of racing, even though mom didn't always like it. Uh, but she accepted because she knew dad loved it. I didn't start racing until I was 18, which is, in today's standards, pretty old. But I must have been genius because I was a quick learner. We had a lot of success in the years I did it. It was a great bond that my dad and I had together. We had so many great memories of doing stuff together. Dad always liked being there, but never could quite stay for the entire weekend. He would often drive in for a race day, watch the races, and then drive home. And some of these races, four or five hours away. One time he drove all the way down to Charlotte in the morning, watch me race, which was a late afternoon, and turn around. And I couldn't talk him out of driving home. He was fixed on driving home, he was driving home. Um, he was always a little bit stubborn for those guys who know him. His passion racing was not only passed down to me, but to also to Laurie, who raced for a bit. My daughter Taylor, who raced, but well, she retired when she was nine. <laughs> Our son Colin, who was successful in his own right, winning four professional championships. Again, it must have been in the jeans. It was always a highlight when Dad would come to the races and enjoy you know, inner excitement. When he wasn't there or wasn't here at the ra or at the racetrack, you'd find him at home on his farm, cutting grass. He loved his mowers. He loved his tractors. He was always in his barn or building something in his workshop. Many of you probably don't know he had a softer side. He handmade his grandkids' first cradles. He made them rocking horses, 
He made them building blocks, which we still have and use, and even playhouses. So that's what our kids got to know and understand about our dad and their grandfather. So he left a legacy. We're all very proud to have him. Thank you for all for coming. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to say that we have uh, a few more speakers that it means a lot to me that they've come in. Um, Dave Christ is going to speak to us. He is um, the head of all of Toyota right now. And we were going to have Damon Rose from um, Lexus Sales Operations, but sadly he had some plane issues. So he will get here, but not in time to speak. So Dave's going to um, handle both, uh, talking from uh, Toyota and the Lexus end. But I do need to tell you a little bit about Dave Christ. So Dave Crest, a local Bucks County guy, makes it big. <laughs> Our paths have crossed a couple times. <clears throat> One, Dave used to be a sales manager that visited our Toyota store when you were with Central Atlantic Toyota. And for those of you that are here from the manufacturers, you'll know that there's a side of dad that Ted took this personal pride in really getting to know the reps, the really good reps. And as they would make their way up the ladder, he would always take all the credit for it. <laughs> he was, he was like, it, you know, if you, if, you believed, if he believed in you, then he was just gonna have your back the whole way. Interestingly, Dave Chris's brother, Jim, was a manager for us at our dealerships many, many years ago. So we have that connection as well. Um, but Dave, after he moved on, he had many different positions, but he became um, VP of Sales for Toyota Financial Services, and then he became VP of Sales for Toyota, VP of Sales for Lexus. Then he was Group Vice President and General Manager at Lexus, so we got to work with him again then. And now he's Group Vice President and um, General Manager of Toyota. And I know personally that Dad was very proud of you, and he thinks you're where you are because of him, just so you know. <laughs> I've been fortunate to work with Dave in many capacities over the last couple of years um, with the various boards that I'm on for Lexus, and I enjoy working with him tremendously, tremendously and I'm proud of you too. I think Jack would want me to start with this. Does anyone need a new car? <laughs> I know Jack liked to maximize full, full showrooms, so uh, it's so great to be here. I feel honored to speak. Um, we've known Jack at Toyota and Lexus since 1969, and uh, honestly, his death touched us all. On January 28th, 1969, we began our relationship by awarding him the point in Doylestown for Thompson Toyota. On June 13, 1989, he was appointed the Lexus dealer in Doylestown. And in April 12th of 2017, our relationship expanded when he was awarded a second point in Willow Grove. Early on in his career, Jack became known in our circles as a sales guy. Somebody who was driven, someone who delivered sales results, but always with intense focus on customer satisfaction. At Toyota, he earned the President's Award, which is our highest honor, the highest award a dealership can earn 32 times, which is among the top of all dealers in the country. At Lexus, he earned the Lexus Elite Award, which is the highest honor any dealer can receive 17 times. So his dealerships always delivered not only sales, but six customer experience excellence and a commitment to the customer that was unwavering. He gave back to our relationship in many ways. He served as the National Dealer Council uh, for nine years. He was appointed among his peers as the vice chairman and eventually the chairman of the National Dealer Council, and that group is the group that we work with to improve our operations, and he represented his dealerships with pride. But all of that is really the business results, and that really doesn't capture the man. Um, the last time I was in this dealership was 1996, believe it or not, and I was the district sales manager. And for those of you who know Jack, he was what we call dialed in. He could pick up the phone and get on the phone any executive at Toyota 
And I was very early in my career. So when I came to meet with him, I didn't know what to expect. Would he give me time? Would he meet with me? Well, in spite of the fact that I really had nothing to offer him that he couldn't get on his own with one simple phone call, he took time with me, he spent hours with me, and he walked me through the entire dealership. And I remember that dealer visit because as we walked around, he knew everyone. And when I say he knew everyone, he knew everyone from the salesperson who started last week to the technician who had been with him for 20 years. He knew everyone, he knew their name, he knew who they were, not just what they did. And I've always respected that about him. His commitment to not only his team members, but to the customers is really legendary in Toyota. And when I think about Jack, the man, I really think about two words. The first is family. He was family to us. Over those years, he helped us enormously. And I believe that Jack and people like Jack are the reason that Toyota was successful in the US. He helped us learn how to be a good OEM partner. He treated his team members at the dealerships like family. Like I said, when I walked through this dealership, he knew everyone and he cared about everyone. And it wasn't a show, it was legitimate. He treated his customers like family. We are all a part of the Thompson family because of Jack. The second word that comes to mind is legacy. What an amazing legacy he has left. When I talked to Laura in preparation to coming here, she explained that this was an invite only event. And the reason it was an invite only is if they opened up the invite, they didn't have a facility big enough to house all the people who would come to honor him. What a legacy. What an incredible legacy that is. Laura and John were happy to work with them and enjoy their uh, execution of his legacy as things continue on with a focus on the customer. And we really believe that Toyota and Lexus are better off because of Jack Thompson. We really believe he was a great man who did great things. And we miss him immensely. Thank you. Thank you. Could you have come up here, please, our next speaker? I asked Brent the other day, how long have you guys been friends? He said, 45 years. Dad and Brent had a very special friendship. I don't want to steal any of your thunder, but it was always like, it's Tuesday. I have to talk to Brent. <laughs> Even when he wasn't feeling too well. i got to talk to Brent. It's Tuesday. <laughs> But the Burge family and our family, even though we were on opposite sides of the country, we became like, well, excuse me, we were families together. I do want to say something because I know Brent won't say it. He's one of the most impressive dealers that I've ever met in my life. Brent is a huge Ford dealer. He's a Toyota dealer. He's a Lexus dealer. Still a Mazda and Volkswagen? Anything else? I like him. <laughs> anyway, he's, he's just an amazing man, and it means a lot to us that he came in to talk on behalf of Dad. Thank you. As Laura said, my name's Brent Birch, and I am a very old friend of Jack's. And I'm honored to be asked to, to talk to you folks tonight. I'm going to keep it short, just, I hope, sweet. Because he was such a special person, as you all know. He touched the lives of so many people. Lorraine, the, the kids, the grandkids, the friends, the employees, and the business associates. And we all just had a lot of respect for Jack. As Laura said, our friendship began over 45 years ago through our business association. And even though we lived so far apart, as she said, we're from Arizona out in the desert, we did so many things. We had so many wonderful times with Jack and Lorraine. And, uh, Debbie and I have gone on many trips with them at 20 group meetings, as Laura's talked about, and other trips. And we got uh, a lot of fond memories. Lorraine did a painting of our, our place in, out in Utah. We still have it in the foyer. We did a wonderful job. So it's a, it's a masterpiece. But we, we became friends because of our business association in the 20 group and, and being both Toyota dealers at the time. But it developed through a lot of other things. Uh, we were both into car racing and collecting old cars. And we had uh, gone to many auctions together. 
Matter of fact, uh, young John here bought a car for me one night. We were in Monterey, and I was standing there, and this guy kept coming over to me, the ring bearer, says, you want to bid on this? And I'm going, no, I'm done. I just bought one. And all of a sudden, he comes over and shakes my head and says, congratulations. I said, I didn't even bid. He says, he bid. And I turn around, there's John with a big smile on his face. He was going, <laughs> <laughs> all the car without a bid. That was a bad deal. No, it's worked out. Okay. <laughs> but, he, uh, but we did the, the, the vintage car racing, the vintage car collecting, and the road rallies, which you guys may have seen some pictures over here with John and Jack standing there with their lanterns on after we've driven a, a long day. You know, we talked about being a people person, and everybody's mentioned that. And of course, as uh, Laura said, in our 20 groups, it wasn't. It wasn't once out of six times that he would mess up and not say that this is a people business. And he learned that a long time ago. And I think he felt that way about everything. So that that was his forte. He really liked the people. But he also had some other sides to it. Mm -hmm. uh, he would, uh, my wife, Debbie, dubbed him Lucky Jack. And we were at auction in uh, Phoenix one time, they had the Bear Jackson auction going. He called me one morning. He got up at 3 o'clock in the morning Eastern time. Caught a plane and flew out to Phoenix. He called me in the morning. I was at work. He called and says, I'm here. And I said, you're going out to Bear Jackson? He said, yeah. I said, I'll stop by there this afternoon. So I stopped by and saw him. And then the next morning I talked to him and he was there until 11 o'clock that night. Now that's 1 o'clock Philadelphia time. And his car went through, it's a Corvette. This guy had spent $70,000 refurbishing this car. The car was just perfect, just beautiful. And they rolled it up on the ramp because they couldn't start it. And so they pushed it up, it's 11 o'clock at night, most everybody's gone home except Lucky Jack. <laughs> and then, since they couldn't start it, he bought it for less than half of what the guy had in the condition. <laughs> Wow. 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 I said, you got to give the guy some money back, aren't you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so they pushed it off the ramp, put it over, popped the hood up, and these guys were looking at it. And Jack goes over and he looks at it. And he goes over the battery and he pushes the cable down on the battery. <laughs> Well, he started, started <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how he is. Whoa. And the endurance he had to think that he'd be up that late at night yeah. doing it at uh, his age. He was older than me. But the other thing that we, were, we, came, we came back back one time to see Jack and Moraine on our way to a 20 room meeting. We spent the night with him. And he came out to Pen Ridge Airport to pick us up. And on the way, he just happened to meander over by the river. And they were having an auction there. So he goes in and he said, we have an auction on this, this house. And he says, okay. And he needed that house like a whole head, like a farm, right? <laughs> but he bid, bought the house, and it was built on pylons. And it was right on the river. So about three or four months later, I read the thing about the river rising, flooding all the homes there. And I called him, I says, Jack, I said, did you do your home? No, it went across the road and flooded all the houses over there. It didn't touch mine. <laughs> that's, the, that's the kind of that special guy he was. But we all uh, we all knew him in a different way. Uh, he he was also very very giving and generous. You know, and I remember when Hurricane Katrina came, he was on the first ones to send money down there. And from that to the local bike races to everything that he was sponsored and put on, excuse me guys, over the years that uh, he gave back. And I know that he did that for his employees, as Dave said, because I've talked to a lot of them. And every one of them said they loved me. So that's how he lived his life. That's how we knew him. And always, we'll remember him. That's why we love him. Sorry. Glenn had alluded to the fact of auctions. Dad, Dad had this, he just always loved cars. Um, one day, um, 
dad got a trade in, in the early days of having a Toyota. And it was just sort of, I can't remember what it was, but it was some sort of vintage car. He's just, the customer was like, this is the only thing I have to trade in. And dad wanted to sell a Toyota so bad. He's like, okay, we can make that work. And he kept this because he had an eye for that car and he knew it would be worth something someday. But the most important thing is he wasn't quite sure that this Toyota thing was gonna work. <laughs> and if it didn't, he knew he had made a good investment in this one car and it would be enough to feed his family to get into the next thing he was gonna try to do. I very much remember that. But speaking of his vintage cars, I'd like to introduce Paul Weinberger. I don't know what Paul is. Paul runs our race shop. First of all, when I look out at a crowd like this, I just think of uh, the impact that Jack had on every one of the, you guys' life, especially mine. Um, so much has been said about Jack with all the speakers, and it's hard really to add anything else to that. And as Laura alluded, I did see a different side to Jack. I mean, he would come, well, I'll just digress just a bit. Jack hired me to attend to his budding collection, and he really didn't have a place to do that in, except there was this pole barn at the end of the driveway <laughs> that had some space in it and had about three or four cars in it. And that was his first shop that I was able to uh, put together for him. His passion was so great that even though we only had a few cars, and I was only working on one car at the time, restoring it, um, every morning, Jack would come out at 7.30 and stop and look in and say, so how's it going today? <laughs> you know, and then I would say, you know, what, what happened during the, the previous day, and he would go, mm-hmm, <laughs> get back in his car and head off to work. Yeah. His, he had a passion for these race cars and cars in general that I really didn't see in many people. And I was so, so impressed with it. And, you know, I could go on for hours and hours about how he would come up to the shop and we would relay old racing stories and stories of when he would go racing and end up driving somebody else's car home from a race. And, you know, if there's a car out there at Allen, well, he drove this guy's hour home from a race, and the guy said, oh, just keep her for a while. He ended up with it for a month, you know, and that turned into a passion for, for hours. But, you know, he always, you know, when he saw a car that he enjoyed and, and had a passion for, he really kind of honed in on that. And when one of those cars, is a car out there, it's a Bentley. It's what I would call a boy racer. It's made up of old Bentley pre-war parts. And he saw this thing on, the tour on the copper state and he really loved it he just thought this thing was it and well it came up for auction and uh, obviously he purchased it well he he just every and this is when now we move the shop we have a big shop it's a little bit out of his way to come to the shop prior to coming to work but he purchased this family and the next thing you know he's showing up every other day <laughs> and he's just standing there and he's looking at it. And he's going, it's a beautiful car, isn't it? I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> it's a really nice car. And, and it wasn't in true proper condition to go race or, or drive. So, you know, we checked it out and we looked it over and the other fellow in the shop, he wanted no parts of it. He had no idea what it was about. I had spent 20 years restoring cars like this. So we went through the car and I got prepared and was getting towards a, the colder part of the year. And so I finally was late afternoon and I called up Jack and Jack, the Bentley's done. He's gone, okay, I'll be right up. Comes up, I said, all right, you've never driven anything like this. The gear shifts on the inside. It's, you're sitting on the right hand side of the road. It's all kind of not quite you know, what he was used to. I said, we'll go out for a ride. We'll go to a certain spot, we'll turn, you know, I'll get out of the car and I'll help you learn how to drive the car. Well, I wish I could start it. This car's a beast. It's just an absolute wonderful car. It's got a ton of horsepower. We get in the car and we start driving. And obviously I was driving a little too spirited. 
for Shaq. <laughs> we get to a point and I said, all right, let's log it up and you know, we'll go and we'll learn how you can learn how to drive it. He says, no, just take me home. <laughs> so we turned around and we went home. And I said, are you gonna drive the car? He goes, no, it's a beautiful car, no. And he, and he still came to the shop after it was all done and would just look at it and go, wow, I really like that car. <laughs> With that, you know, I, like many of you have said, you know, Jack was in the people. Um, his business was people business. And how he always cared about people and how he always um, looked to see how he could serve people. I know when he would always come to the shop, he would, you know, he wouldn't look to see what was being done or how much progress was being made. You know, the words for him were, first of all, how you doing? Doing good, okay. Well, what's new? Have a little conversation on what's new. And then, he, you know, we tell a couple stories, and then right at the end, he would always say, do you need anything? And it wasn't like I had to tell him what I, you know, what was done on the car to serve him, he was turning around asking me, what did I need to serve him, to get the job done? And that's a lesson that I think is, that has been instilled in me from Jack. And it's a lesson I'm still trying to apply to my life, but I just want to thank Jack for, for giving me that lesson in my life. And that's, thank you, Jack. Thank you, Paul. I told you he sees a side that not many of us get to see of dad. And it was, you know, dad was always a quiet man, but he was also a man of few words. And I think that Paul pretty much summed it up the way he talked and the way he expressed so much with so little. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I hope um, somehow we needed a cathartic something because how do you deal with losing dad? Um, but I really, I want to thank you all for coming. And I just want to make sure, um, Dad cared so much about land preservation, historic um, preservation in the area. And we kept trying to think, what could we do that would be a memory for Dad? And I think it was actually Taylor's idea, and I loved it, um, I used Taylor. Um, we have some native seeds that are indigenous to this area. And we would like you to help yourselves and take packets as you're leaving. And when you're planning them, you think of Dad. And I think you'd really appreciate that. Thank you very much.